I'm so glad you all are here. I've never had a standing room audience before, and I just feel so overwhelmed. OK, so I hope I can live up to your expectations. Um, I want to start with getting this slide to move forward by pushing the button. <laughs> OK, there we go. Um, so I want to start with a 90 degree July day in Boston. This is Boston Common, and there are people getting ready for a party. OK, this is July 26, 2010. Does anybody know what party we're about to celebrate? Oh, yeah, tell us. The 20th birthday of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is George Herbert Walker Bush signing the ADA behind the White House on what he said was arguably the proudest day of his presidency. We've got 54 million persons in the United States living with disabilities, and the numbers are growing. This is a very diverse population, and it's not always obvious who are the people with disabilities. We know that young people, for example, who walk around with their earbuds, I hope I'm not talking about any of you, um, the hair cells in their ears might be damaged by loud music, and so there's a growing number of young people who are hard of hearing, and these are, this is a population of people with disabilities who you would not necessarily know from uh, just seeing them on the street. We know that the heroes who are returning from Iraq and Afghanistan are often coming back with incredible injuries that are teaching us a lot about caring for wounded warriors with disabilities, but they are also presenting a huge issue for the Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense Health Systems. But this is where the real issue is, and this is a population projections for the 65 and over and 85 and over from 1900 through 2050. And as you can see, the number of people who are elderly is going to be growing hugely in the coming decades, and aging and disability are very closely related. So across the entire lifespan, all the way from birth to old age, the number of Americans living with chronic conditions and disabilities is growing. And as a 2007 report on the future of disability in America by the Institute of Medicine said, disability in America is not a minority issue. It will virtually affect every one of you <laughs> in this room or someone who you love. OK, so if everybody is going to be affected by disability at some point, why is it so hard to make healthcare facilities fully accessible to people with disabilities? Why, in 2012, do people with disabilities still experience disparities in their health care? All right, that's the big question. What I'm going to try to do is look at this question from four angles. First of all, I'd like to convince you that there are, in fact, disparities in health care for people with disabilities. Secondly, I'll give you a brief historical and legal view of disabilities and disability rights. Third, briefly talk a little bit about barriers to care that could be contributing to these disparities. And finally, talk about the kind of solutions in a very global 10,000-foot way, basically patient-centered care and universal design. OK, evidence of disparities. We're going <coughs> to flip through a number of federal reports. This was um, Healthy People 2010, which was released by the federal government in 2000. It was the first time in these decennial <laughs> blueprints for what the next 10 years of healthcare improvement should be address disability. Chapter 6 was all about disabilities in Healthy People 2010, and it talked about people with disabilities experience disparities in primarily preventive and wellness care. Healthy People 2020, which was released in November of 2010, perpetuates this interest in people with disabilities. And if you go onto the Healthy People 2020 website, you can see the kinds of things that they think could improve health for people with disabilities, and it's interesting social and environmental determinants of health perspective. Because Healthy People 2020 talks about improving health for people with disabilities by getting them jobs, improving their education, reducing poverty, OK? Big things. 15 years after the ADA passed, the US Surgeon General at that time, Richard Carmona, released a piece about disparities in health care for people with disabilities. Every year, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is mandated by Congress to come out with a report on disparities. It often focuses primarily on racial and ethnic disparities, but it also talks about people with disabilities every year. And then finally, in 2009, the National Council on Disability issued a report on disabilities. 
But if all these beautiful covers of federal reports don't convince you, let me get some data on board here. So this is from some work that we published a number of years ago using National Health Interview Survey Disability Supplement data. And we found that, let's just talk about the first one, that women with major mobility difficulties, in other words, women who could not walk short distances or use wheelchairs, were 70% less likely than other women in reproductive age to be asked by their primary care clinicians about contraception. <coughs> now, why do you think that might be? Do women with disabilities ever have sex? Is that what I heard over there? <laughs> <laughs> You know, could they be at risk of unintended pregnancy? You know, it's very interesting because in these data, men with major mobility problems were slightly more likely to be asked about contraception than were other men. And we think that, well, okay, I guess people probably have figured out why that might be. We don't know from these data, but the fact that there's erectile dysfunction that you can actually address for men, you know, and for women, who knows what to do for them. Anyway, that could be kind of, um, that could be one of the problems. We'll talk a little bit about reasons that pap smears and mammograms are so much less likely for, um, for women with disabilities than for other women. But how about men and women who are smokers with major mobility problems are 20% less likely to be asked their smoking histories by clinicians? Why would that be? Anybody have any ideas? Well, we can't tell, again, from these data, but qualitative research um, in a variety of different disabilities suggests that clinicians, number one, don't really know much how to help patients with disabilities stop smoking. They also may feel that if smoking gives comfort to their poor little disenfranchised lives, that why address it? But obviously, if you have major mobility problems, quitting smoking is really important because you're at risk of, of severe pulmonary infections and so on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about breast cancer. These are from some data that we did using um, SEER data. These are our cancer registry data from around the country. And let me just walk you through this slide. These, this is a huge <coughs> data set. Women with disabilities, 2,800. Non-disabled women, 97,000. And there are two basic treatments for early stage breast cancer, mastectomy and lumpectomy. Lumpectomy is where you just remove the tumor and the tiny bit of tissue around the breast tumor. The deal is that for those two to be equivalent in terms of disease-free survival, you have to follow the lumpectomy by radiation therapy. Okay, so just keep that in your mind. Okay, so what we see is that women with disabilities are much more likely than other than women without disabilities to have mastectomy. And in fact, when we did um, uh, logistic regressions, looking at adjusting for a variety <laughs> of different factors, the adjusted relative risk of women with disabilities having a lumpectomy, which you would think is the preferred procedure because you're just removing a tiny amount of tissue, women with disabilities were 24% less likely than other women to have the lumpectomy. All right, now remember that if you're going to have a lumpectomy, you have to have radiation therapy to have the same disease-free survival. What we found after adjusting for all these things like age and race, ethnicity, marital status, a variety of tumor characteristics that were available in these registry data was that women with disability were 17% less likely to get radiation therapy than were other women. And in fact, we found that women with disabilities were much more likely than other women to die from their breast cancers. Okay, my qualitative research, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to tell you the story of a woman who I'll call Mrs. Shannon. That's a pseudonym. Um, when I met her, she was 56 years old. I went to her house to visit her. Um, and she lived in a small little modest dwelling um, with a man who I'll call Eric, who she'd actually lived with for 23 years, but she had never married him because if they got married, she would lose her Medicaid. And so she could not be uninsured as a woman who's tetraplegic from polio, so she needed to remain unmarried from Eric, even though they'd lived together for all these years. She'd used a wheelchair since 22. She was an educated woman, but she had not worked for many years because of her disability. Now, Eric would take her to go to her mammogram appointments, but the mammography equipment was not accessible, wheelchair accessible. And remember I told you on a couple of earlier slides that women with disabilities were 30% were less likely than other women to get mammograms? 
Well, a lot of the reasons might be that the equipment is simply inaccessible, and so they're not getting mammograms. And so what Eric would do is he would lift her up and hold her against the machine, and so she could get her mammogram taken. Of course, he's exposing himself to a very tiny dose of radiation while he's doing that, but at least it got her her mammogram. However, her breast lump was actually not found through mammography. It was found when she went to her gastroenterologist. Her primary care doctor never got her out of her wheelchair for a complete examination. Just said, I don't have a table that lowers to wheelchair height. I can't lift you out of your wheelchair. He always examined her sitting in her chair. But Mrs. Shannon had developed inflammatory bowel disease. So her gastroenterologist needed to get her out of the wheelchair for a complete belly examination. Fortunately, he went above the diaphragm one day and he found the breast lump, and that's how her breast cancer was found. Now, for students in the room, this is not how you do qualitative research, okay? <laughs> I confess that right up front. I was leading the witness as I was asking this question, <laughs> okay? Um, so this is not how you're supposed to do it. But they started talking to me about how upset they were that the surgeon did not realize that Mrs. Shannon wanted to preserve as much of her breast tissue as possible. And Eric kept talking about not wanting to do, reduce her cup size of her, bre of her breast. So <laughs> they were just sputtering. At, uh, <laughs> right, he didn't want that cup size to go down. Um, so they were just sputtering. And I finally said, OK, I'm going to ask a leading question to just make really clear that they felt that this breast surgeon was discriminating against her because she had a disability. Do you think they thought, because you're disabled, that it would not matter to you about your breast size? Yep. That's what you think. Yes, absolutely. So after the surgery, she had the lumpectomy to minimize the cup size loss. Then she had to go have her radiation therapy for eight weeks. Every day, she had to be lifted onto the radiation <laughs> table because it was not wheelchair adjustable. It did not lower to 18 inches off the floor so she could easily transfer. Eric could help her do that back when she had her breast cancer, but he's diabetic. He has bad legs, and so sometimes it's hard for him. As he said, he'll lift her, but um, it will get more and more difficult for him over time to be able to do that. OK, so some major threads from what I just told you in the Mrs. Shannon story. Physical access barriers, potentially discriminatory attitudes. There's lots of other issues that I haven't gone into, such as the fact that there haven't really been any clinical trials on what chemotherapy you should give for women who are post-polio who develop breast cancer, but we'll leave that for another day. So have I convinced you that there are disparities in care for women and men with disabilities? Do you nod your heads? Yes? OK. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good. Great. OK. So let's move on really quickly. And sorry, I'm going so lickety-split, but I want to get through all this. This is not, I promise you, a political statement. And I know that my former governor is now in Florida, and I apologize for that. Okay? Um, and, but I just show this because disability is often the elephant in the room. You know, it's one of these huge things, it's this large mammal lurking in the room that nobody wants to talk about, but everybody touches little different parts of it and views it in different ways. If you touch the tail versus the trunk, you think it's a different beast. And so disability is just really, really hard for people to understand and to talk about. Now, if you Google images for hunter-gatherer societies, this is one of the pictures that you'll find. And I show you this picture to remind you why human societies formed. Human societies formed because some people among them could not hunt could not gather, could not do the basic things in life that are needed for sustenance. Most notably, human infants. It takes them a while to be able to do all these kind of tasks, but also elderly people and people with disabilities. And so human societies really form to kind of make sure that the weakest among them could live. However, we have evidence going back millennia that people with disabilities from the earliest time were viewed as suspect, were viewed as people who should be shunted aside. This is from Leviticus, the Old Testament. This is text about the kinds of people who should not be allowed to approach an altar during a religious service. A man blind or lame, or one with a mutilated face, or a limb too long, or a hunchback, or a dwarf. 
This is a picture by Peter Bruegel, the elder of, um, it's not really sure who these people are. The title of the picture is The Cripples. And the iconography is that these little tunics that these um, men are wearing have foxtails on them. And the iconography is that foxtails back in the Middle Ages represented lepers. And so these were probably lepers who were isolated very much from society, maybe for some legitimate reason. Um, but certainly, people with disabilities were often isolated and shunted and put aside. We have evidence from the 13th century and the 14th century in Europe that as charities began to come, come together and would give out alms to deserving people like widows and young children, that people with disabilities also became a class of people that would get alms from charitable organizations. But there's evidence that people started to fake disabilities to try to get these alms. And so there were people who were appointed to try to decide who were the meritorious disabled people who should be allowed to get alms. And so from that point forward, literally centuries ago, the concept of disability has always been kind of focused around the need to detect who are the deserving disabled people and who are the imposters. This is a photograph from 1812. This is the picture of the first stethoscope. It was uh, invented by a French physician named René Lenac. And this is the first instrument that allowed physicians to putatively tell what was going on inside of somebody's body and therefore make a determination if somebody had a true and real disease. It was also the first time that physicians were able to separate themselves from their patients. In the past, physicians to hear the patient's heart and respirations would put the ear on the patient's chest, but now the physicians were able to have a distance from their patient by being able to listen to them through a stethoscope. And this started in the 19th century, just a proliferation of inventions that allowed physicians to become what basically became the arbiters of who's a meritorious disabled person. And this gave physicians authority. They became the objective arbiters of who had disabilities, and they would determine who would get income support, who would get health insurance, and a variety of other kind of programmatic benefits. And it put patients and physicians at odds um, at, from that earliest time. And created what, and this is very simplistic, because I'm going at lickety-split pace, but became what is called the medical model of disability, where disability is basically a problem of an individual person who has a disease, a trauma, a health condition that causes them to not be able to operate normally in um, the way that people ordinarily do. The solution is a cure or a medical treatment, and if the person cannot be treated, then acceptance and resignation <coughs> adjustment to loss. And as one woman who I interviewed said to me, disability is a lonely state. This was perhaps the loneliest disabled person of the 20th century. I hope people know who this is in this room. <laughs> yeah, OK, OK, this is great. OK, people know FDR at age 39 developed um, polio after visiting um, some young boys on Campobello Island off of the coast of Maine. And he never, ever walked again. Um, this is actually only one of two photographs remaining of him seated in his wheelchair. Um, the press corps around him at the time, if they saw a photographer coming up to try to take a picture of him, would literally grab the film out of the camera and throw it away. Um, they were very, very protective of his privacy. But then, after FDR, and again, we're going lickety-split, Lots happened, <laughs> OK? Um, we had the 60s and the 70s. We had civil rights movements for racial and ethnic minorities and for women. We had what was called the independent living movement, um, which started on the West Coast at Berkeley with Ed Roberts, who had had polio as a child and was quadriplegic and wanted to attend school and have personal care assistance to help him get up and dressed in the morning. And, and he and his cohorts became what they called the rolling quads. Get it? You know, the wheelchair rollers <laughs> on the quadrangle. Um, and actually, the second CIL um, in the nation was founded in my hometown, which is Boston. Um, we also had people who felt that, no, we don't want doctors to take care of us. We want to figure out um, how to take care of ourselves, eschewing um, professional health. And so again, very simplistic presentation, but just to make the point that disability became viewed as a, as a social 
problem of societies that fail to accommodate difference. And the causes are stigmatizing attitudes, people just not thinking about it, failing to build accessible environments, social barriers. And the solutions became changing the way people think. And disability became a human rights issue. Now, unlike civil rights for racial and ethnic minorities and women, disability rights never really filled the streets with marching millions of people. And part of this is because of the diversity of the population. You know, people who are born deaf may not relate to me in a wheelchair, and I may not relate to them in the kind of foundational, intrinsic way that you would have to do to join together as, um, as a kind of civil rights movement. But at the end of the day, a various kind of floating coalition of a variety of dis disability rights groups got together and they, and they um, lobbied Congress and they got the Americans with Disabilities Act to be drafted and passed. And finally, the, um, the law passed because the legislators felt that it was simply the right thing to do. Ultimately, everybody is touched by disability. So then again, we have George Herbert Walker Bush signing the ADA on July 26, 1990. Now, these are the elite wheelers leaving Hopkinton, Massachusetts, heading off on the marathon. And I like to make the point that the wheelers come in about 25 minutes quicker than the bipeds do. Very <laughs> proud of that. Okay. Um, and they're shifting language. So if there's one little kind of politically correct thing that I'd like you to come away from this talk with is get rid of the phrase that's so commonly used, wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair. Because, trust me, if anybody's tried walking with me in my wheelchair, I go pretty fast, don't I? My wheelchair does not bind me. I will be out of here. <laughs> now, my friend Michael has a quicker wheelchair, and he always kind of, yes. But anyway, I would like to have a quicker wheelchair, too. <laughs> but, um, and especially with the curb cuts and buses that are now accessible and so on, um, people's wheelchairs allow them to just get around and do whatever they want. And so when people say to me, well, Lisa, what do you want us to say about you other than your wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair? I say, get rid of the metaphors. Just use a simple subject and verb. Just say, I use a wheelchair. I'm a wheelchair user. I am an active, action-packed person, right? <laughs> OK. However, the New Yorker magazine <laughs> you know, always kind of brings you down to reality. OK, and this is my favorite. Um, this is my favorite one. And this is, this is a war shark test that I use now. I, when I got this, I put it into PowerPoint and I emailed it around. And a very dear colleague of mine named Margaret Steinman, who is a physiatrist at Penn who has used a wheelchair since early in her life because of a congenital condition, wrote me back and she said, oh, this is hilarious. It's so appealing, A-P-E-E-L-I-N-G. <laughs> Sound like Margaret, right? Yeah, it sounds just like Margaret. We were just talking about Margaret. Um, and some of my um, TAB friends, that's temporarily able-bodied friends, um, <laughs> said to me, oh my god, how could the New Yorker have put something like this on their cover? You know, so obviously disability still, you know, there's this little frisson <laughs> of discomfort around it. Okay, so people recognize this picture. This is the iconic Rosa Parks who in December of 1955 was asked to move to the back of a bus in Birmingham, Alabama because of the color of her skin. Rosa Parks knew that she had achieved civil rights as a black woman when people might notice the color of her skin, but it would not affect whether she gets onto the bus and it would not affect where she sits on the bus. So here I'd like to make the tiny distinction, actually it's a pretty big distinction, sorry, it's a big distinction, between civil rights for Rosa Parks and civil rights for me. For me to even get onto the bus, the bus has to be built so I can get onto it. My stigmatizing condition, my disability, has to be actively recognized by the bus driver who has to unfurl that ramp so I can get onto it, <coughs> if the ramp works. I mean, there was one time in Harvard Square where four buses went by me, and every single bus driver yelled to me, my ramp isn't working. 
And in the meantime, all the other passengers are sitting there looking at their watch saying, oh, she's going to make me 30 seconds late by having this happen. So this is just a very clear difference between disability, the response to disability rights for somebody with a, disabil for, with a disability versus that for somebody who um, has civil rights protection because of racial or ethnic minority status. Now, the first thing that the Supreme Court started doing after the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed was they started ratcheting away at this. This is a second way that disability civil rights differs from civil rights for racial and ethnic minorities. If an African American person or a Latino person or somebody who is an underrepresented minority wants to bring a lawsuit because of their racial and ethnic heritage, all they have to do is claim that heritage. They don't have to prove it. But somebody with a disability first has to prove they are disabled before they can bring a lawsuit under the ADA provisions. And this is the definition of being disabled under the ADA, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of life's major activities. It's a very, very broad definition. And so what the Supreme Court started doing as soon as they got this law on the books was they started ratcheting away who would qualify as disabled and thus be able to bring a lawsuit under the ADA. And this is George W. Bush with his dad over there. See dad, dad, H. W. Bush over there, signing the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendment Act in September of 2008 because it was a law that was passed because they realized that the Supreme Court had just ratcheted back so much who would qualify under the ADA that they had to enshrine it and codify it better in law, who would qualify to bring a lawsuit. Okay, now you would think that one of the things that the ADA would have assured was something like access to public buildings. And so I'm not gonna go through many lawsuits with you, but I just wanna go through this one because I think it's just so telling about the fragile balance that we have on the court right now. This is a case that um, is now a few years old. It was called Tennessee v. Lane, argued by the Supreme Court on January 13, 2004. This man who was not quite an upstanding citizen um, named George Lane had a traffic violation. And he was brought for a misdemeanor, misdemeanor um, to um, his courthouse in Benton, Tennessee one day and was going to be arraigned in the morning and then there was a subsequent hearing in the afternoon. Now he arrived and his case was scheduled to be heard in a second floor courtroom with no elevator. And he happened to use a wheelchair. And so for the morning arraignment, he was lifted out of his wheelchair by the guards who carried him up the stairs, apparently taunting him all the way as they were doing that. And so in the afternoon, he refused to let the guards who he claimed had taunted him, lift him out of the wheelchair and carry him up to the second floor courtroom for the arraignment. And so he was jailed for failing to appear in front of the court. And so he sued the state of Tennessee under the ADA for rights to have an accessible courtroom, um, the fact that he'd been jailed by not having gone to a room that was not accessible to him. Now, this is John Paul Stevens, who wrote the opinion for the majority. This case was run by George Lane by a vote of five to four which is the slenderest of margins, okay? Um, and this was before Alito and John Roberts came onto the court, and so it's, it's a different court. Um, but anyway, Stevens wrote this case, but very narrowly, saying that the right to receive justice in the United States is so enshrined that people with disabilities need to have access to a courtroom, but just a courtroom. He wrote it narrowly because he wanted future cases to litigate other types of needs. So for example, during some of my interview projects, I would interview people with disabilities who would tell me that the Medicaid enrollment office in their little rural community was on the second floor of a building without an elevator. And so th these kind of cases will probably be litigated for a number of years. But Rehnquist, the late um, chief um, of the Supreme Court, wrote in his dissenting opinion that it was okay for people with disabilities just to be lifted out of their cares and ch chairs and carried. Now, obviously, I don't think it's okay. It's unsafe for the person with a disability, and frankly, it's unsafe for the person who's carrying them. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that there's a very sl slender thread 
that's keeping disability rights kind of in the direction that somebody like me would think it should be right now. And we'll just have to see in the cases going forward how that plays out. Okay. However, we should not have barriers to care in healthcare facilities. Okay? And so what I'm going to try to do is run through um, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so a variety of different barriers to care, ranging from kind of physical access barriers to attitudinal barriers. And so let's, <coughs> let's go through some of them. Okay. Um, the first thing is that the gold standard for how you decide what's the right treatment to give a patient is the randomized controlled trial. People have heard of randomized controlled trials where people are randomly assigned to treatments. Okay. People with disabilities are routinely, systematically excluded from randomized controlled trials. And so there's basically almost no evidence for women with disabilities about what chemotherapy they should get, if they happen to get <coughs> breast cancer and need chemotherapy, and all the other therapies that you can imagine that have undergone um, randomized controlled trials. There's also small numbers of cases for certain types of disabilities that might complicate efforts to do observational studies of treatments. And so there's a huge gap in the scientific evidence base that's used to prescribe treatments, not just medical treatments, but also a variety of different other kinds of treatments. Now, what I found in my qualitative research was that it was unbelievable that physicians would sometimes not understand the most basic things. Um, this is a quote. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, can somebody put this slide back? It seemed to go forward. Um, this thing. Okay. So this was a quote from somebody who needed to have a mole removed or something from the, her, his lower leg, and um, and had a spinal cord injury, like a T10 spinal cord injury or something, and the the dermatologist refused to give the patient lidocaine for the mole removal because the dermatologist claimed that this patient couldn't feel pain because he'd had a spinal cord injury. This is simply not true. You know, people with spinal cord injuries can sometimes feel hyperacute pain below the level of the injury. And in any case, especially if the person has a high spinal cord injury, they could be at risk of something called autonomic hyperreflexia, which is a life-threatening condition if they experience pain below the level of their spinal cord injury. So, but I found this systematically time and time again that physicians simply would not listen to their patients when their patients would tell them what was going on with them. Okay, this is a great one. Um, this is a woman who also had like a T10 spinal cord injury. Her name is Marsha. And she had, um, she had rotator cuff problems. She was beginning to have problems. She self-propelled her manual wheelchair. And so she went to her doctor and her doctor's statement was, you've got rotator cuff problems? Just raise your arms. Does anybody see any problem with this? <laughs> okay. This is how she gets around. She gets around by using her arms to push her wheelchair. And so um, the way that Marsha feels is I think more than the able-bodied community, we have to be very resourceful. We have to be problem solvers because doctors don't problem solve for us very often. Okay. This is the Bullfinch building at my institution, the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. It was built, oh, centuries ago. <laughs> okay, and this was back in the <coughs> olden days. You know, it was okay to have stairs back, you know, in the 1800s. But this is my new hospital. Actually, it's, this is an old photograph. We now have another high-rise building in it. And you would think that that buildings like the MGH, everything would be really, really accessible in it. It's brand new, kind of spanking new, all sorts of high tower types of buildings in it. Um, but in fact, it's not. And this is not just true for a place like the MGH. It's true throughout healthcare that, that we find facilities that simply are not physically accessible to people with disabilities. And so, in trying to figure out why this is, the only thing that I can kind of come up with is that the leaders of healthcare organizations feel that patients are there for them to care for, right? And that there's a sense of beneficence, that they will take care of patients, they will care for patients, they are kindly but in control, that if patients need to be moved, that clinicians will move them. Patients are not independent actors in healthcare settings. However, 
This is a quote from a woman who had a spinal cord injury from a car crash during her high school graduation. You know, a really classic and really sad story. And 20 years later, she developed um, breast cancer, and she came to my hospital for her care. And the way that oncologists determine what the chemotherapy dose is, is by the height and weight of the person. And so she needed to be weighed. But there was no wheelchair accessible scale in that huge medical edifice that I showed you on the slide a little while earlier. And so the way that she was weighed was that her oncologist lifted her out of the chair, held her in his arms, stepped onto the scale, and put her back in the chair, weighed himself, and that's how she was weighed. This is a quote from um, another woman who I interviewed who had a lumpectomy. She had cerebral palsy and had the kind of sometimes athetoid movements that people with cerebral palsy can sometimes have. And so she had a lumpectomy, and so she needed to have radiation therapy after her lumpectomy, but when she would be put onto the table, her arms would move. And so women, when they're put onto the on radiation, on radiation therapy table, are Velcroed, strapped into place across their waist so that their bodies don't move. Well, you could think that they could have had some Velcro straps for her arm or something like that, but they didn't. Instead, they masking taped her arm to the table every time she went for her therapy. Eight weeks, she got masking taped to the table. All right, now if you Google images for, um, for transferring patients, this is one of the photographs that comes up. And you can see here that transferring somebody out of a wheelchair onto a table is not good ergonomically in this photograph for either the patient or the healthcare practitioner. And I show this slide to remind us that according to OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration records, the leading cause, the, the profession with the leading number of occupational injuries is truck drivers. But after that, the second highest rate of occupational injuries is healthcare providers. And this is because they're constantly moving patients onto tables. Okay. Now, they could get an accessible table that would lower to about 18 inches off the floor that would allow a patient to easily transfer, but they didn't. And so, and Kaiser Permanente, do people know about Kaiser Permanente out in California? It's this huge mega healthcare plan. It's got millions and millions of patients. On, Janu on July 26, 2000, 10 years to the day after the passage of the ADA, a man named John Lomberg sued Kaiser Permanente <coughs> because he had been quadriplegic. For years, he had gone to his practitioner, repeatedly asked to be gotten out of his wheelchair for a complete examination. They had said that they didn't have the right table, they didn't have the right number of staff to be able to lift him out of the wheelchair. He was brewing a decubitus ulcer on his buttock that went undetected for a year until it was finally found. Okay, for people who don't know, pressure ulcers are very nasty, very bad can take months and months to heal if, in fact, they ever do. So he sued with wheelchair users on July 26, as I said, 2000. Kaiser knew they had a problem. They immediately went to settlement on this in 2001. And so Kaiser facilities are still, to this day, trying to put accessible tables throughout their system to be able to care for their disabled patients. I think that there's also a problem, and I think that this is going to be true not just for physicians who often see patients in very narrow windows, but also for physical and occupational therapists who might be, there might be some of you as students in this room, because you're only going to see patients when they're coming to you for a certain problem, and you're going to have limited time with them. And so you may not actually know how people are living their lives in a daily way out in their home and community. You may not appreciate the environment within which they live, what their house is like, um, and you may not really fully understand the way that people value their lives. So I really would urge you, your students now, as you're working with your patients, as you're working on therapy with them, to try to get to understand what they do in their daily life. 
Um, I think that there are huge threats <coughs> to people with disabilities right now, especially brought on by 21st century medicine, um, in that conditions that once rapidly caused death are no longer causing death. People are palliated enough to live into early adulthood or middle adulthood and sometimes now into late age with significant disabilities. And they're prolonging lives, but the question is who decides when somebody has a particular emergency or something like that develops a pneumonia, for example, could be treated for that pneumonia, but who decides about whether that person's life is worth saving? And this is a quote that gives me shivers um, when I read it. It's written by a very famous medical educator named Eric Castle. The basic struggle in chronic disease is not against death, it's against disability. It's not the deaths of these patients we find so awful, but their lives. And in the dot, dot, dot there, he goes to list a variety of conditions that are so disabled that he finds so awful. One of them was multiple sclerosis, which is what I have. And so that's, you know, when I read things like this, it just sends shivers up and down my spine when I read. <coughs> now, this is a quote from a woman um, named Ruth Moore, who's quoted by a disability rights activist who wrote a book um, in 1996. She was talking about, um, uh, she had a spinal cord condition um, that would require surgery, but she was very, very concerned that the neurosurgeon who she was talking to did not truly value her life. Even though she was a woman living with a fairly significant disability, she nevertheless viewed her life as valuable and something that was well worth living. As she said, the neurosurgeon told me that he was only interested in quality of life. Nobody has asked me what criteria I would use in judging what was an accessible quality of life. And there have been a number of studies that have shown that Physicians and other clinicians and their patients have very divergent views of what's quality of life um, when they look at certain levels of disability. And this is a picture of a good friend of mine um, whose name is Michael Ogg, and he has given me complete permission to use uh, this photograph. Um, he is tetraplegic from primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and he uses, as you can see, a big rehab power wheelchair. And a couple of summers ago, I gave him a treat of a trip to Birmingham, England, which is where he was born, to go visit his 85-year-old mother. And I went with him, so it was a trip for me, too. Um, and this is a picture of him in the Birmingham Botanical Gardens. And I think you could recognize from looking at Michael that he's pretty disabled. Um, he, he actually can no longer feed himself, um, and he cannot do any ADLs at all. So of the five basic ADLs, he cannot do any of them. But I was with him on January 11, 2012. This was just less than a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the odometer on his wheelchair. The odometer on his wheelchair had just passed 7,000 kilometers. 7,000. There it was. This man has ridden that wheelchair 7,000 kilometers in just about three and a half years. And so that just gives you the sense of how somebody, even with a really significant disability, can be out there and getting around and living a full life. OK, so just in the last few minutes that I've got, some solutions. And then again, these are very, very kind of quick, um, since I have so little time with you. This is a woman who I interviewed who's wonderful, and I call her Eleanor <laughs> Peters. Um, she had polio as a small child, and she now uses a wheelchair. Um, she is sitting in front of a beautiful glass, plate glass door with a beautiful chrome handle in a building that was opened in 1996, 16 years after the Americans with Disabilities Act, Act passed. There is no automatic door opener. This is the primary care clinic in this particular facility. She cannot even lift up her arm to knock because of her post-polio. And so what she does to get attention to be able to get into the primary care clinic is she kicks the door. And so not only is she having to sit there and kick the door, but the assistant, you know, the secretary who's sitting behind the desk now has to come up and walk around and open the door for Eleanor Peters. Now, if they would only take a universal design perspective, when they would design a facility, like a primary care facility, they would think about 
all the people who use that facility. So it was hard for Eleanor Peters to get in that door, but so would it be for parents pushing a child in a stroller. So would it be for somebody using a walker. So would it be for somebody who's carried a carrying a lot of packages because they went grocery shopping before they went to the doctor. Um, you know, just think universal design thoughts. Just think, OK, who's going to be coming in this door? How should we design this door to be maximally accessible to everybody? So the bottom line, number one, that I wanted to emphasize is adopting a universal design perspective will not only help the patients, but it will also help the staff. That secretary will no longer have to get up and around and open up the door for her. Remember that baby boomers are coming, and so it makes sense for both business reasons and humanistic reasons um, to think about making your facilities as accessible as you can. Now, this is um, President Obama. Um, oh, sorry, the thing just decided it was going to go forward. OK. This is President Obama signing the um, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the ACA um, for short, um, on March 23rd, 2010. And there's a lot of provisions in the ACA beyond the provisions that are controversial in states <laughs> such as Florida, not so much in states such as Massachusetts. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, but um, <laughs> slip that one by you. Um, <laughs> we have 97% of, of people in our state have health insurance. Anyway, um, <laughs> Section 510 of um, the Affordable Care Act establishes standards for accessible medical diagnostic equipment. And so the ADA established standards for accessibility of buildings, but it didn't talk anything about the equipment inside of the buildings. And so the ADA, the, um, the um, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, within two years of its signing, is supposed to come up with standards for accessible mammograms, accessible tables, accessible weight scales, et cetera. And you can actually get information about how to develop accessible facilities off of the Department of Justice website um, at, in Washington, D.C. It's very easy to find this kind of information. And the point that I want to make is just remember to do it right from the start, because it's cheaper to build something accessible from the start to, than to retrofit it. For example, that, that facility that I showed you that Eleanor <coughs> Peters was sitting out in front of the door, it cost them $25,000 per door to put op automatic openers on all of those doors, all those clinic doors. They finally decided that they had to do it about 10 years later because it was just getting to be pretty embarrassing that their patients were able to get into the facility. Um, the other thing is um, that ADA standards are minimal standards. Um, for example, the automatic door opener was not actually required by the ADA. It's not illegal to not have an automatic door opener but if you're running a hospital clinic, it just makes sense to have one there so your patients can get in. And so this is um, a, a clinic in the same building on another floor that I actually helped help them design. And you can see Eleanor Peters uses her mouth stick because she can't use her hand to press the button to be able to get in the door. You can't really see, but there's no threshold on the do underneath the door to the clinic. It's a very smooth surface because sometimes even a tiny threshold can be very, very difficult for somebody to wheel across. And so this clinic kind of did it right from the start. OK. So just my final comment is um, uh, the Institute of Medicine in 2001 released a report called Crossing the Quality Chasm, lamenting the poor quality health care in the United States despite you know, the $2.6 trillion that we're now spending on health care in the United States every year, there's a lot of problems with it. Okay. And they came up with six solutions for how to make care better. I'm not going to go into the other five. But the first one that I'm going to, and the only one that I'm going to talk about, was to make care more patient-centered. To have care be respectful and responsive to individual patients' preferences, needs, and values. And Don Berwick, who was the former director of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services until he resigned um, just in December, viewed this particular, he was on the IOM committee that did the Quality Chasm Report. He viewed this particular recommendation as the true north for guiding healthcare reform to make care patient-centered. Now, this might sound very touchy-feely, you know, oh, it might feel good, you know, it's just nice to have it be um, patient-centered. 
There actually is empirical research that shows that when you do engage the patient and try to understand better what their values and preferences are, that that is an intrinsically therapeutic interaction for any type of clinician, be a physical therapist, occupational therapist, physician. Um, that, um, that the feeling of being understood by another person is just very, very helpful if somebody is sick. It restores the sense of connectedness that is needed for patients to fully recover. So I urge you to just keep that in mind as you're thinking about patient-centered care. So the bottom line here is to make no assumptions about patients' abilities, needs, preferences, or expectations. As my um, story about my friend Michael would tell you, I mean, if you saw him, you would think that he's sitting alone in his house all day, but he's not. He's traveling all over the place. And so just ask patients what they would prefer and then work collaboratively with them to achieve patients' goals. And I always like to end with a picture of Independence Day. <laughs> so, okay, that's the end of my talk, and thank you so much for